you. Welcome. I know you're coming in. And for those who are watching on demand, welcome to Cardiac Radio and the Spirit Society of Virginia. We are here together in one more Spiritist Talk where we can share the teachings of Spirit Wisdom that are so important for our lives that really sustain us and recharge us and boosting us the best that we can, especially at this time. Right now, let us confess, it's not easy. Of course, it's not supposed to be easy. It's the pandemic. Who said it was going to be a breeze? But what do we do? What we're doing right now, we get together. And as we are together, we are renewing our strength and we count on the good spirits who never stop helping us, our protector spirits and the ones that are assigned by our center, by Kardec Radio, to visit your house as well. Why not? It's up to you. If you open up, I see friends like Daniel Pion here. Hello, happy Friday to you too. And we have our team here. For those who have children, remember, you can connect to the Facebook page of the Spiritist Society of Virginia to watch live the short lessons. They're not long, short online Spiritist lessons for children. And uh, Daisy and Carol will be there with you to lead those beautiful and very important lessons. And you can connect there with your children and submit your activities, the activities that they fill out. So we can one day put it all together and share with the friends all over the world. For now, today we have a special moment for us here. May 1st. For us spiritists, what is May 1st? May 1st is... Professor Deeper Disbarsonufu's birthday. He would be turning 140 years old today. And he died when he was 38 years of age in the Spanish flu time because he was helping everybody. He was a major, a major healthcare provider in his city back then when we didn't have the resources that we have nowadays. And he did a whole lot but he also passed away in that condition. What a perfect timing for us huh? to celebrate his legacy, his presence in all of our lives, because he's still caring for all of us. And if you want to know more about him, the Spiritist Magazine has a whole issue that talks about him. You see his picture on it, his name. I forgot the the, the issue of that and I'll probably type it in later as soon as I recall it. So you have an opportunity to check on his life, his legacy, and connect with his beautiful mind. Now, for us today, we're talking about heaven too. We're talking about the beauty of heaven. And we have our special friend and guest of the Spirit Side of Virginia and Kardec Radio's host as well. Brian Foster with us, which is a joy for us to receive his presence here and his studies. Before he begins it, I'm going to call our friend Paloma, who is going to read for us a major message. You may be asking, why do we read these messages before the meeting? You can write in the comments if you know the answer. And I bet you know, but for those who apparently don't know or don't know for real, we do this because it's a way for us to prepare our minds to be here. So these messages are like teasers saying, come in, come in, don't get distracted. Let us focus because once we are here mindfully present, we are going to gain a whole lot of therapeutics, okay? So our dear Paloma is going to read a message to prepare us, mind and bodies, for this beautiful Therapeutic Educational Moment. Good evening, dear friends. We are going to read a message from the book, Our Daily Bread, psychographed by Chico Xavier by the Spirit Emmanuel. And the chapter is chapter 66, titled Goodwill. C, 
See to it that you live prudently. Paul, Ephesians 5.15. Goodwill finds work to be done. Work leads to renewal. Renewal finds the good. The good expresses the spirit of service. The spirit of service brings understanding. Understanding brings humility. Humility wins love. Love leads to self-denial. Self-denial reaches the light. The light promotes self-betterment. Self-betterment sanctifies the individual. The sanctified individual converts the world to God. Proceeding prudently through simple goodwill, the individual reaches the divine kingdom of the light. And in the spirit of goodwill that Emmanuel writes to all of us, inviting us to this everlasting exercise with God. We're going to invite you for the prayer. Let us pray together. Feeling the presence of the good spirits with us. You may close your eyes if you want. And if you feel like keeping them open, just concentrate. And it's a matter of us keeping our minds focused on the words, feeling them, and joining forces. Let us feel the loving vibrations of the good spirits with us. Dear Mother, Father God, we trust in you and we know that you are our sacred source of life of love, of peace, of health. We unite ourselves to this invitation of healing, healing the mind, healing the bodies. We feel the molecules of love permeating ourselves, renewing our hope, and especially our bodies. We visualize this light of your love enveloping our homes, our relationships in new harmony. And we pray for everyone who is in great distress. May they feel loving spirit doctors, nurses, and therapists to their rescue, treating them with the utmost care. Breathing in and out your loving envelopment, we feel secure 
to step forward in this togetherness as we study about our true destination. Raising our eyes to the Most High. And focusing on the light of your star. May we be guided by your loving care. May our dear friend Brian Foster lead us into new understanding. And may we all feel the envelopment of your love during the whole session, with your permission, we begin it tonight, and so be it. All right, dear friends, we're going to pass the word to our dear Ryan Foster, who is here. Okay, hold on. Thank you, Brian, for joining us. My today. pleasure. It's a joy to have you here, and especially talking about this topic that is so needed, Brian. I confess to you that with the occurrences and talking to several people working on the field of mental health, it has been so tough on so many people talking about the realities of the earth right now that it will be fantastic to talk a little bit about happy. <laughs> All right. So I'll pass the word to you, Brian. Well, thank you. So I'm excited to be here tonight. And I, I think as just as Vanessa said, that the realities of Earth sometimes, you know, weigh heavy on our shoulders. But what we need to look for is what is awaiting us? Why, why are we going through this? I, and I think everyone knows, but let me restate it again. We are going through our trials on earth, so we may go to heaven and be prepared to become a actually a, a spirit who contributes to the spirit realm. Right now, we are more like in training, learning how to behave ourselves and how to be civilized. And that's why I like giving this talk, because if you can see what is waiting for you, now, then you can understand what sacrifices you wish or not wish to make. So, let's start. Okay. Hold on a there we go. So, the levels of heaven. And perfect. So, this is exciting because what will show here is there's a lot of information about heaven if you've read the books by Alan Kardec, Chico Xavier, and hopefully to a lot of people who haven't read the Reverend G. Val Owen yet, there's even more information about the higher levels of heaven. So let's begin. So when, when Jesus said, my father's house has many rooms, it's very interesting because you know, when you read the Bible first, you know, before you're a spiritist, you, you think a lot of, you know, there's, everything's in parables and descriptions. But Jesus was being factual. Like, he also said things like, not a hair of your head is hurt, not a fledgling falls from its nest, but the father of all is notified. And as we read the books and we understand, it, it was actually talked about in the domains of meaningship in the uh, in the preface by Emmanuel, we're saying everything we think is recorded. We all have a unique ID. Everything we think is re is recorded. That, that's how, you, there's nothing we do that is not unseen. He also says, let the dead bury the dead. Forgive 70 times 7. All those things mean much more when you're a spiritist because there's something behind them that you know exactly what it means, right? You forgive because if you don't, you have 
you have you know conflicts that can go after you and with you life after life so this is this is carrying on now i'd like to tell you what's awaiting for you to really study and listen to what is being told to us so the first level of heaven i think a lot of people have seen the movie no solar or astral city in in english and that picture was actually created by a medium uh, who drew it from from what she thought uh, no solar looked like and of course it's a great movie i recommend everyone to go to go uh, look at it but this in the story of no solar is the journey of andre louise from his death to his arrival at the celestial city of no solar and he describes his first impression upon being outside of the shelter he was taken to during his time of recovery. This is what he said. The spectacle of the streets impressed me. Wide avenues bordered with trees, pure air, an atmosphere of profound spiritual tranquility. However, there was no sign of inactivity or idleness, for the city streets were crowded. Countless individuals were coming and going. Some seemed to be thinking of a far off places, but others looked at me warmly. So as you can see, this is one of the first things that should that should you know pique our interest is that heaven isn't isn't some cloud you know misty place where you know we do nothing all the time. Heaven is a working city, and a lot of times you know it, you read in spiritual literature, the earth is is like heaven, less perfect, and that's what's important to, re to remember is that the earth someday will be will get as we get to a planet of regeneration, we become more and more like the first levels of heaven. So here's a better picture of it. You can see very organized, you know, there's, there's, there's a, there's an organization. There's a, a, like a governor of the city. There's ministers of the city. There's water there. They, they make food. They, they, you know, there's classes. It's just like a regular city. That's why when you go there, you will be familiar with many things in that level of heaven. Now, the interesting thing, though, is you might ask, why is no solar surrounded by a wall? I mean, it's heaven. Can, you know, so this is one of the things that piqued my interest is, okay, why is there a wall there? Well, no solar is, is really, it's at the upper reaches and the lower reaches of, of heaven. So, so it, 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 it's attached or close to the umbrow in Portuguese or the lower zone, as they say in English. So therefore, it has a wall because its, its boundary is next to the lower zone. And the lower zone is where souls who have not yet changed their attitude can come and try to get into the city. And in the book, No Solar, there is a story about No Solar possibility of being attacked. No Solar has guards. There's no weapons, it doesn't kill, only stuns, and it disorients the attackers. There's also, you know, stories about this when in Henri Luis is in a, a kind of an outpost lower in, in the lower zone called Mansion Pass. And, and again, they have weapons to keep people from attacking it because, of course, in the lower zone, there are, there are gangs, there are, there are armies, there's organized cities, you know, the lower zone and... The, the dark abyss or purgatory, some people call it, is organized. So that just kind of gives you a, a place of where heaven is in context. Now, let's talk about other things. Let's, let's start talking about heaven itself. So what we've been told is the first levels of heaven is about, is about 50 to 100 years advanced compared to earth. So in the 1910s, when Reverend G. Val Owen's mother talked to talked to Reverend G. Val Owen, she talked about an apparatus to help their work. And then according to Spiritist writings by uh, Chico Xavier, the, he said that they were talking about, again, you know, like a computer terminal. And of course, the, they showed in the movie, they showed com computer terminal and other things. And when she was talking about an apparatus in the 1910s, she probably also was talking about a terminal because she certainly didn't use the word typewriter in her prose. And then, of course, then in 1944, when Nosalar came out, they were talking about personal communication devices, a.k.a. cell phones. And cell phones really, you know, the smartphone didn't come out to about the year 2000, you know, around that time. So, again, 
they're you know 50 years in advance uh, from you know no solar is 50 years in advance from the uh, the world the earth so it's, it shows you what when you go there what's waiting for you and when people have these ideas and these geniuses create these devices it's because they've seen it before and as they get ready and they're inspired by their spirits they seen have seen what these devices are in heaven and people are more prepared for them so now let's go up now in the books by reverend G. Val Owen, they talk about 10 levels of heaven of course and the spirits have talked to the reverend G. Val Owen. will say well these these numbering systems are arbitrary and that you know don't worry you know we're not gonna you know this is just we're talking to you about them other people have other numbering systems so I just want to make sure you understand that. But there was a good story in what in the, the life beyond the veil. And you were talking about the sixth level of heaven. And in, in this, one of the spirits was telling Reverend Z. Bowen about a couple would live a good life as a country squire and his wife. Now his wife died first and waited for her husband. And he came to her, not recognizing it at first, because of course, she was young again, but she died at an old age. And she was in this high level of heaven because they both lived honorable lives, taking care of their people. Now, when you think, and they described the house like it was a, a idealized, perfect form of a country squire house. Now, one of the things we want to, I want to make sure people understand is this house was not constructed brick, brick by brick. It was constructed by thought. And when you understand that thought is action in heaven, thought creates, thought destroys. You know, it, what you, thought does is you focus your mind, you bring universal fluid in to do what you want to do. So when you understand how powerful a spirit is as they go higher and higher in the levels of heaven, it helps you understand why we must go through the chaos and trials we do here on earth. It is training. So let's go, carry on some more. So this is a, this is a scene in the um, sixth level of heaven that I wanted to you know, read you about. So there's many mentions of dogs and horses pulling carts, and they're all happy in their task. I kind of, you know, put it to like in an idealized Renaissance fair, right, where people don't smell, right? They're, they're all clean and nice. So let me let me read this to you. So when we arrived at at a town where was to be their home for a while, these are people who have left from one level, and gone up to the next. The citizens came forth in bright attire, both men and women, and some few children. The trees which grew on either side met overhead in some places, and choosing one spot, the oncoming company came to a halt and awaited our coming. They brought garlands of plants and flowers and beautiful raiment and jewels for their new sisters. Then these they arrayed with them and with their less radiant garments melted away and vanished before the new robes proper into the sphere into which they were now come. Then each admits her friends, all happy to welcome and be welcome as to home. They who had come turn about and stuck up a, struck up a sweet marching air with instruments of melody and sang as we went forward towards the gate. Here the townspeople thronged the walls and towers and gates and cried greetings of welcome to add joy to joy already great. Now, does that, you know, does that sound like heaven? I mean, that sounds like a, a, a wonderful movie you'd like to see over and over again. And it, it's quite clear that people are relaxed. They're not stressed. They, you know, they, you know, they're not anxious about their health. They're not anxious about earning their money. They, they, they understand that the, the journey is, is all, right? It's, it's how you become a better spirit. It's how nice you are. Imagine living in a, in, a, in a neighborhood where everyone talks well about each other. They support each other. That is heaven. Let's carry on. So on the... here sorry
So then, let's talk about the ne next. And that's, uh, let's go up to the 10th level. I'm trying to give you a good level, you know, uh, just a, as I get more in detail, I want to give you a good idea. So, and the 10th level is Abdile's house. And this is how he described it. Now, let me tell you first is when a, when the Reverend G. Val Owen said, and as Zabdal was the spirit talking to Reverend G. Val Owen, goes, can you, can you describe your house for me? And he said, well, he goes, it, trying to describe my house to you would be like trying to describe Westminster Abbey to a fish. Because what, what I will tell you is I will tell you about my house as another spirit saw it from a lower level of heaven in how he thought the house looked. And so this is what I put here. He said he saw the great towers, but they shone so brightly with their blue light that he could not tell where they actually ended because the light shot up into heavens above and seemed to continue them there indefinitely. Then the domes, some were red and some gold, and the light from these was likewise too dazzling to see where they ended or what was their size. The gates and walls likewise shone silver and blue and red and violet and blazed with dazzling light was bathed the hill below and the foliage of the trees around. And he wondered how he would enter and not be consumed. Now it's quite clear from the information from the Spirit Zadbao that his home is really a place of work, that it is a vital point of communication with spheres above and below. It also has specialized areas to facilitate live or in-person meetings with beings who are either beyond an old environment or are not yet suited to a more advanced atmosphere. Additionally, this house works as a switch switching yard where packets of information come from above and below and are examined in disposition to either send them onwards or to be fulfilled immediately. It all sounds sterile in its functionality, but all of the effort and work completed by each individual is solely focused on one aim, to help other spirits improve, gain knowledge, work through their problems in order to discover answers to what has been holding them back. Every detail, every item is covered in love and love for fellow spirits, incarnate and discarnate. You can also think back to, if you've read No Solar, when you're talking about the governor of No Solar, how he doesn't sleep and he works all the time. One can imagine where the governor of No Solar is tied into things like Zabdile's house on the 10th level, when there is a problem that he needs helps and he meditates and prays, his prayers probably go up into some superior level, as Zabdile's house could be, he asks questions and he gets information back. It, it's just the, you know, when you start really looking at heaven and you think about all the complex systems, this is, this is the exciting part of, of you know, spiritism. It, it gets down into the gritty detail. You know, who would have thought, oh, there's a, there's a communication message packing center with, you know, also adds, you're kind of like a call center where people can call in in for help, right? Well, that's on the 10th level of heaven. It's probably in other levels too. Of course, we're only given little peaks of this. But I mean, this kind of starts to show you what what is there, how complex it is. And it should make you excited that there's so many jobs there that, you know, whatever you can think of that would please you and make you excited, is there's got to be a job for you somewhere. So, now, why am I talking about this? Why am I so excited about, you know, about giving this talk about heaven? Well, let me tell you about myself first. Now, you know, there are children who, when they're young, you can just see they're spiritual, right? And they're calm and they're relaxed and they'll sit and birds will come, you know, on, you know, on their hands. And I was the opposite of that, right? I was not that child at all. In fact, when I was in uh, Bible nursery school, we had a talk, right? And we had this little book and each page was like there was an animal and the other part of the page was, and then Jesus is part of that animal. And you go to the next page and there was like a giraffe and it's, Jesus was part of that. Jesus is in that giraffe. 
And then in the last page, there's a little mirror. And then you're supposed to say, so we were seated like in a little semicircle and I was the last little boy on the row. And my mother was there with the other ladies trying to tell us what to do. And each, you know, each child before me would look and go, oh, well, that's Jesus in me. And the next person said, oh, that's, that's Jesus in me. And, and then it came to me and I said, well, that's me. That's all I saw. That was me. Of course, my mom was super embarrassed. You know, and then it didn't get better when I got older, because when I got older, uh, you know, I would crawl under the pews and look at people and I just couldn't control myself. So I was I was never one that that thought that, you know, I was a calm, spiritual, you know, mature, mature beyond my age soul. So th this is where I mean, I, th this is where it's exciting to me that I can start understanding that because I've been always been. You know, as my younger days, I was a very concrete thinker. When I was in church, another thing that embarrassed my mother is our reverend would come down the middle, like where I was Episcopalian, and I'd go over and I'd shout, Mom, God's coming, right? That was my idea of God. So uh, that's why I'm giving this talk, because once I found spiritism, it's like, oh, there's concrete things to hang on to. It's not fuzzy. It's, you know, it's real. And um, so, and of course, I found spiritism because, you know, my wife, told me things, you know, it's just, you know, and she had an NDE when she was like, I think 17 or so, and we didn't get married till she's 31. And she would tell me parts of the future. And I would never believe her until she told me what would happen in such specificity to be, you know, mo very improbable. It's possible, very little of what would was going to occur. And it occurred. And that would brought me on my whole, uh, you know, my, my whole journey into how could my life be, be predetermined? Once you once you accept and understand fully with the basis of your of your whole being that predetermination is real, then everything has to change, right? Then there has to be there has to be some organization that is predetermining what you're doing. There has to be some organization that is guiding you on a daily basis. There has to be an organization that looks at reports, go, oh, Brian's doing this, and analyzes, right? Analyzes what you're doing and, and, and talking about, it, and it's all there. So that's why I'm giving this talk. So what I was told, so what I was told in my first meeting, so my wife and I, when we, we both started together in spiritism, we went to a spiritist meeting, um, in Rio de Janeiro, we, you know, we vacationed here many, many times when we were living in the United States. And they said, no, we're going to invite you to a mediums meeting. Oh, okay. And we sat on the, you know, in the back against the wall. We were, we were not at the table or anything like that. And there was a message for us. And I'll just make this very short. Basically, we were told that my wife and I had been together before and that we had failed many, many times in our previous lives on what we were supposed to do. We thought about our own self and our money first and about being rich instead of helping people. And we were told in this life that we need to plant seeds. And that's how, and really, if you think of it, that's what all of us here on this meeting right now who are interested in spiritism, that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to change ourselves. And then also hopefully as time goes by, talk to other people and plant seeds. So in my opinion, this is just me, other people, my other opinions, is what are the basic tenets of spiritism? And really, when you talk about spiritism, it's the, they are the essential fluid and air in which we swim, walk, and run in our daily lives. The seven tenets explain why your life is the way it is and how by realizing the divine force that surrounds us is a force for love you can surmount any obstacle and withstand any ill wind and not only survive, but prosper for that is why we're here on earth to learn, to improve and to gain experiences, to place in the bottom of your heart that love, understanding, caring, you know, and serving are the tools we should use to solve every situation. So what I've taken from is I, what I've written about is to me, the seven tenets are that we are immortal souls, God and Jesus loves us. We have multiple lives. 
During our lives, we pay for past debts and accumulate new experiences. We live and learn in close family groups. Our destiny is mostly predetermined and we are assisted in our lives by unseen spirit forces. Some people can see them, but not I. So let's get back to talk about heaven. So let the dead bury the dead. Now, I know this was also meant for the people, uh, you know, if you read the um, Gospel according to Spiritism, it's also meant for the people who kind of live and they, they're not really alive in their physical life. But let's talk about when you first get into heaven. So the spirit realm will assist you into heaven. And according to Chico Xavier, a very interesting statistic, only about 30% of people ascend into heaven, was the law of affinity. So of all the world, about 7 billion people, right? 30% will go into one of the levels of heaven. The other, the other 70 will be in the lower zone or the dark abyss. Now, how do you ascend? Well, no religion is required. You just have to be a good, loving, kind, fraternal, charitable person. Follow the golden rule. That's what they said. If the spirits told Alan Kardec, if you want to, you know, get us down to the bare essentials, it's follow the golden rule. Now, but as you learn more about heaven, just like any good corporation, what kind of people do they want there? They want intellectually curious, self-driven, and self-disciplined people. They don't want yes men. They don't want people that, oh yeah, I believe anything you say. No, they want they want people who question and understand and get interested in things and get excited about about new intellectual uh, possibilities and discovery that i mean i cannot emphasize that enough no one wants people the spiritism the spirits do not want us to become spiritists because someone told us to become spiritists it's because we through our own rationality decided that's what we wanted so now let's get into kind of the details. So the first level in death, let's talk about the first level. Now that that picture is the reincarnation pavilion. And during the meetings meeting, my, I was told, and I was told that my wife and I, we spent decades in that pavilion. So what does that mean spending decades? I'm not quite sure. I'm pr probably pretty sure it meant that I failed in the last time and that they figured I needed a lot more time that I'm an extremely slow learner. Um, so that's all I can think of. So there are places that prepare us for our next life. Now let's talk about the organization of, of No Solar. And there's a lot of information in the, the great book, No Solar. And so it has over 1 million residents. 30,000 people are employed in the defense service. You didn't really see that in the movie, right? They didn't show that part. The governor of No Solar has 72 ministers. There are six ministries. Each has 12 minister, ministers. Regeneration with work on earth, assistance associated with, uh, also associated with work on earth, communication uh, on earth, elucidation, probably sending us messages and information for earth, and then elevation that's connected with the higher sphere and divine union is connected to the higher sphere. The governor has a staff of 3,000. The governor, since 1944, has been in charge for 140 years. Now, we can add another 60 or 70 on that one, if he's still in charge. But, so over 200 years. So think about this. This is in, like, the first level. There's work, but you don't have to work. But if you don't, you don't get benefits, such as traveling to Earth. You get bonus hours for each hour. There's a scale of up to triple bonus hours for taking care of children. And it takes about five to seven years of work to buy a house. And there's also dorms and rooms you can, you can certainly go into too. You don't have to work. Families stay together in the house. Sometimes a wife, you know, could stay, you know, with a, two husbands from previous lives or husband has two wives or whatever. And this is a... a a quote, this is, they were talking about Del Solar in the book, and this is, this is one of the books telling Andre Louis, one of the spirits telling Andre Louis, he says, we are no longer on the sphere of the globe where discarnate spirits are compulsory promoted to ghost status. 
No, we live in an environment of hard work. The jobs in the Ministry of Assistance are laborious and complex. The duties in the Ministry of Regeneration require strenuous effort. Those in communication demand a high standard of individual responsibility. In elucidation, they require a great capacity for work and profound intellectual values. Those in the Ministry of Elevation require self-denial and spiritual enlightenment. Lastly, the activities in the Ministry of Divine Union require right wisdom in the application of sincere universal love. The government center in its turn is the busy seat of all the administrative activities and numerous services under its direct control, such as nutrition, electric energy, traffic, transportation, among others. Actually, the law of rest is strictly observed here so that certain workers do not become overburdened than others. But the law of labor is also strictly adhered to. As for rest and relaxation, the only exception is the governor himself who never uses what he is entitled to in this respect. And that is no solar. Now there's all sorts of other heavenly cities. They say, they tell us no solar is about 50 kilometers above Rio. And there are thousands of other colonies above thousands of other cities. And each city has its own culture. And not until one moves higher do you learn to start casting off culture and you learn to work together. As an example, Chico talked about his own sister, who was a devout Catholic. When she died, she went to a Catholic colony. Above Jerusalem, there are colonies above Israel, but they don't mention Jesus. Every, you know, everything is respected in you know these different cities so you don't get too much of you know change right they're 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 getting this when we go to another heaven they get us get to it you know uh very carefully they make you ready for it so the now on another state the first level according to jiva owen's mother she says that the atmosphere is also naturally affected by vegetation and by buildings for let me repeat these houses have not been raised merely mechanically but are the outcome growth, if you will, of action of those, of the will of those high in rank in these realms. And so very powerful creative wills. And of course that was in Ajivao Owen's Life Beyond the Veil. So we're seeing, you know, we're seeing information from Alan Kardec in the 1850s, Ajivao Owen, 1910s, uh, Chico Xavier, right? And I think in, uh, in the 1940s, no solar. If you have read Violets on the on the Window uh, from the Spirit Patricia, talking about another lower level city, you get all these different from different mediums and different spirits. They're telling us things that all come in 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 comparison. That that heaven is real, and the first levels of heaven has a lot in common with earth. Things are alive, and things are created by thought. Now, what are the major themes of heaven? So let's talk about that. So basically, basically life is like here on earth, but a heck of a lot better. There's no sickness. There's no money problems. You work at what interests you. You have friends. But let me, first, let me talk about work. There is this great scene, it actually was in the movie too. And there's a one woman in No Solar. And there was a scene in, in where Henri Luis was waiting to talk us out. What work did he do? And he went with this woman. And the, the guy first talked to the woman. And he found out that she had worked over a six year period, she had worked 304 hours. So she only worked a little less than eight 40 hour weeks. And when he said, well, you know, she, just, she said, I want to go see my family. He goes, well, you have to earn the right to see your family. How many hours have you worked? You know, well, not very long. And but, she, but she didn't want to work. And she said, well, I don't like that job, or I didn't like this job. And they kept trying to give her different jobs. But even then, all with love, they said, okay, well, you don't have to work, but then you just get, you know, the minimum, your clothes and your fed. And, you know, she only worked a, a total of two months over six years. And then, you know, there's also, now the other thing I know that scares people is you think, okay, there's these bureaucrats, you know, and, you know, we all have this fear of bureaucrats. But there's this great scene in the book, Memoirs of a Suicide, where 
you know, a friend of Camilo Bronco wanted to go see his family. And he was kept, they kept telling him, you're not ready. You're not ready. Cause no, I want to see the man in charge. And he, in Camilo Bronco said, he just steeled himself to go up to this, this bureaucrat and all he cared about was process. And he'd tell me what to do. Well, you went to him and he said, well, my brother, I'm just a humble person. I know what you want to do. I don't think you're ready. And he was so humble and so nice. And so, you know, uh, you know, understanding that he was, you know, this guy was totally disarmed, but he, again, he really wanted to go. They let him go. It was a bad idea, but spirit world will let you do your bad ideas sometimes. So they know you will learn from them. So learning in heaven. Now this is the part where I think that many people haven't really seen when you read the books by Chico Xavier, you don't hear this much. There's, there was, there was more of it in uh, violets on the on the window, but so let's go. There's a lot. There was a lot exposed in the books by G. Bowen, which I talked about in my series of three books. Though so each level has a series of schools in the outer cities. So if you look at Nosa Law, it's probably a you know bit bigger plane of where things go. In fact, Patricia said that these air buses go from colony to colony. So each, each of these small colonies have some smaller schools, but then each major city in each sphere has a college where people go when they have completed their courses. And from there, they may ascend to the next sphere. Now, all of this is voluntary, right? Remember, the woman didn't work. You don't have to take classes. One doesn't have to ascend. And although people are given lectures and glimpses and tours of higher level to encourage them, So let's talk about an, a, an example of a school. So one is the College of, of Colors, and this was described by G. Val Owen's mother. And she described them as, you know, as I'm told the results of these studies are handed on to those in charge of trees and other plant life on Earth and other planets. But there are other results which are too rare in nature for such application to the grosser environment of Earth and other planets. So of course, only a very small part of these studies is handed in on your direction, meaning towards Earth. And then she described them more. She says that one of these great holes was the orange hole, and in it were all the tints of that primary, from the faintest light gold to the deepest of deepest orange. Another was the red hole, where hues were ambient, all about us from the faintest rose leaf pink to the deepest crimson of the rose or Delilah. <clears throat> Another, the violet hull, was radiant with hues ranging from the most delicate heliotrope or amethyst to the dark rich hue of the pansy. And now I must tell you that there were not only more, but several more of those hulls devoted to those tints, which you do not know, but which you call ultraviolet and ultra red and the most wonderful they are. So here you see, you know, the, the variety of what is taught and what is talked about and what you can pick on your own in heaven. So then they also start telling you how to use your mind. This is what Jeeva Owen's uh, mother told him about how they first started learning how to use their thought, right, to modify universal fluid. She said, we all sat around the open space and concentrated our wills on the object to be produced. Very quickly it appeared and stood there before us. We were much surprised at the quickness of the result. But from our point of view, there were two defects. They were told to create a statue of an elephant. It was much too large for we had failed to regulate the combination of our wills in due proportion. And it was much more like a live animal than a statue. And for many had thought in their minds of the live animal itself and also of its coloring. And so the results were a mixture between stone and flesh. Also many points were disproportionate, the head too large and the body too small and so on. It is thus we learn our imperfections and how to remedy them in all our studies. Again, she said that, you know, if you don't think we laugh here, you're wrong because we all laughed at the result of what we saw. And then they were given some, you know, to do, do an orange tree and they tried to do an orange tree. And so it's just very interesting how they start learning and they get feedback. They, they show what they need to, what have done in heaven. They get feedback of how much universal 
fluid they use, the vibration and harmony of how they bring it together to create what they want to create in their minds. Now think about how complex we are as a spirit, that we must have these, these routines and applications in our minds to draw universal fluid and create what we want in this logical manner. Spirit world is very complex. So what makes heaven run? How does it work? Well, remember that what he said, not a hair of your head is hurt, not a fledgling falls from its nest, but the father of all is notified. Everything is recorded. Everything is looked at. Everything is analyzed. It's what I call it is the universal database. There is, there is nothing missing. And spirits, as told to us by other spirits in the Chibaoan, if you're a really good, you know, higher spirit, you learn how to, in your mind, connect to that data. It's like you have an internet, right? I, just with your mind. You don't have to be at a terminal like you are in those alarms. They haven't learned that yet. But you can just connect to anything you want and pull information. Now, I'm sure there are areas secure and not secure, depending on your level. But it's all there. It is so complex. And, the, the, and this is one of the things they teach you in the levels of heaven. But how does the law of affinity really work? How does information flow from place to place? Things that are hinted at, but what I don't know, right? Because they only tell us what we're ready. And so there must be so much more that, that we don't know. It, it must be amazing. So how is this accomplished? As I said before, everything is tracked. Everything. There's nothing. You know, you can, you know, anything we think that we is hidden is not there. In fact, there's a interesting little side note is during the time, of, you know, the year 2001, we, uh, the terror, and they wanted to start tracking everybody very closely. And the NSA, National Security Association, says, well, you know, it's like finding a needle in the haystack, right? We need to track all these movements by who knows who. Well, what they figured, to find a needle in the haystack, what do you need? You need a haystack. And that's why they created big server farms. And, and so, you know, here is, you know, they take every ATM machine, every time you charge at the gas station, everything they can electronically is brought into these big server farms and they can search for what they need to search for, everything on our cell phones. We have no privacy. We even have less privacy in heaven. So, you know, it's actually people say, oh, this is a terrible culture. We have no privacy. But my, you know, my retort to that is, well, you might as well get used to it. Now, as I mentioned before earlier, this is, this is, you know, put in concrete by what, by Emmanuel, you know, said in the book, in the realms of mediumship. This is what the quote is. This is on page nine. This is in the uh, preface. Through the sentiments that characterize their inner life, all individuals emit specific rays and live within the spiritual wave with which they identify themselves. Such truth cannot remain semi-hidden in our sanctuaries of faith. They will radiate from the temples of science like mathematical equations. So this will be it more and more intrusive as we go on. Now, let's talk about the organization of heaven surrounding the earth. First, I'd like to tell you that I'm talking about the heaven surrounding the earth. There are other heavens above, but which I have no idea, and they hint at, but this is, I'm going to tell you what we can know now. So this is what we're told. Jesus is the governor of earth, also of three other planets, one lower level, two higher levels, and the fifth is forming. Antulio is one of the grand instructors for the physical and spiritual evolution of the planet. I have no idea who this person ever was. Another minister is not named, is in charge of the biological evolution of the planet. And while a separate minister is the head of the geography of the planet. Socrates, Buddha, and Zoroaster are all ministers who came to earth to prepare the way for us to learn and about spirituality and to teach us the methods to become better spirits. Of course, I, and so this is, again, telling you, I'm trying to get, here's, I'm putting some meat right on the hook. This is, you know, this, this kind of outline of heaven, this fuzziness should start becoming clear that this is organized. This is lead. Jesus is our wonderful carpenter that came in full of love and, and helped us on earth. But he's also a CEO. He, you know, he's the chairman of the board. 
of us and other planets. He knows what he's doing. He's extremely competent, unbelievably perfect. So what's the purpose of the organization surrounding Earth? Well, this is the other one to, to get in. So the sad fact is we on Earth think, oh, we're special. We're on Earth. We're on this blue planet. Well, actually, we're more like a school, we're a campus. The Earth is here to assist the human race, any spirits that come in and go out, right, to ascend as individuals and a collective whole. First, we go through multiple lives, learning to become better people, right? We have to learn love, fraternity, honesty, controlling our emotions and thoughts. Life on Earth is mainly to modify our character. Intellectual growth isn't that important. We're not here to become geniuses. Why are we in this physical body? Because I believe, because when we're in this physical body, emotions wave over us and the spirit world can create stimuli to, to change certain, certain aspects of our character and our personality. If you're in heaven and the atmosphere is love and nice and everyone supports you, you don't have this hit on the head or the slap in the face to say, ah, you need to change that character, you know, attribute you have. You know, it may be slight, but if you want to be perfect, you better change it. Not, not many people are going to say that truth to you probably in the levels of heaven because they're too busy trying to support you and be positive, which is good. So we are here on earth to live through the rough parts to really mold our character. No one cares that if you're an intellectual genius or they don't even care if you accumulate billions in yachts. They just want you to have a better personality and character and be an honest, loving person. And so that's why the goal is for each spirit to become a productive member of society. So I hate to tell you this, right now we're not productive. We will be productive when we graduate even up above the 10th level where we actually start part of the creative process. Right now we're productive, some of us are productive in the spot that we help the teacher erase the board. And But that's why you know we're going through this training because we need to really learn to discipline our minds. So uh, Lawrence asks, how can we control our thoughts and our thoughts, emotions, if we can't control the active belief systems that drives it all? Well, that's a good question. And yet, what is expected? So how would you answer that? And I believe the way to answer that is you, you can't control the active beliefs. You, you can't control the real system out there. But you'll have to learn to control your your attitude and your, your, what you want out of it, I think. And this, this is a hard lesson. And it's a good question. I don't know exactly how to answer that because everyone's different. They have to control their, you know, what they, what they think their own life should be. And, and that is something I think is we should go in another whole talk and, and go over that because I could go on forever of how that can happen. Oh, Daniel says, one curiosity I have about rivers, clouds, and other natural systems that seems to be present in heaven, is a river constantly created? Where does it end? Where do the clouds go? Well, if you think about heaven, think about heaven. So, if you're looking at a video game and you see mountains and rivers and clouds, where where do the mountain rivers and clouds go? They are They are logically created things. Now, even when you're in heaven, though, you see a river and you put your hand in the river, it feels, it feels real. And in fact, they talk about no solar, there's a ministry of, of water, they take care of the water, and they energize the water, and that the river must flow. So exactly where it flows to, I don't know, but it, everything has, you know, lakes and everything, it all has, probably each area has its own ecosystem that is well thought out. But you know, that's a great question. And, you know, and, but, you know, I would say that most of it was created by higher spirits and they created this ecosystem for each level of heaven and maybe subgroups and sub levels of heaven and also of uh, the lower zone and, and purgatory, the dark abyss. And they probably made them a, a complete closed ecosystem. But I don't, I don't know for sure. 
this is what, you know, once you start learning a little bit of this, you're like, let's get into the details more. And of course, I don't have all the details. I'm getting more though, that uh, as, you know, as we can. So let's, let's talk about the 10th level when you conjure. So the, the, the spirit Zabdiel, he's talking about, okay, how do you use your mind? And this, and he, you know, he demonstrated the power of wills to, to some children in, in the 10th level. He says, well, why am I doing this? And he says, in the earth life, your will, your willpower, it's an in indefinite quality as mostly understood. Something between truthfulness and a right understanding of what is right and understanding of truth. But here, where we study all things as to their essence, we know that faith is more than this. It is a power capable of scientific analysis in a measure and correspondence with the progress made by man. So if you look at that, faith in the spirit realm is power. It's raw power. It's power to create, transform, and destroy. This should give you a clue of why we all have our tragedies and our disappointments in life, because you're giving these stimuli to make us be disciplined in our minds, right? Because we've got real power in there. And hence, only those who have been rigorously trained and tested are allowed to weld such an instrument. This is why we on earth to learn how to control our mind, right? So one day we can manage this, this divine power. And I like to say on the levels of heaven, if you're on the first level, you really can't go to the second level. If you're on the second level, you can't go to the third level because it's just too bright and you can't, you know, the law of affinity kind of keeps you where you are. You just can't stand the environment. And that's, of course, this is why people, when they see angels, they think they're angels. They're just fuzziness because they're higher spirits and they radiate, not radiate, they reflect the love of the, of the environment about them. So, and of course, when they say faith, it's just like, I know this is right. I know how this is done. And faith, faith you get with education and experience, right? When I talk about faith, and you think, well, faith, I don't know if I have faith. Well, yes, you do. You have faith every day. When you go in your garage, you open your garage, you get in your car to go to work. You have faith that the roads are okay, that the bridge isn't down, that people aren't going to run the red light and smash your car, and they're not going to rob you on the way to work. Why do you have that faith? Because you've been there many, many times. You've, you've driven that. You've been there. And that's how it goes. And then, uh, well, yes, the Lord says the density of our essence, and, and that is very true, is that he says the density of our essence determines the level we can and not, can't, can't rise to. In fact, that's what happens as you rise from one level to the next. You become less matter and more energy. The ratio of, of energy to matter is greater the higher you go and less and less. That's why if a high spirit goes down to the lower zone, the other spirits in the lower zone don't even, they don't even know that person's there. They're invisible unless that higher spirit transforms him or herself into something more dense. Okay. Building the temple in the fifth level. So again, I'm not going to go through this. I think I'm taking a long time as it is. So, and I'm running behind, but basically uh, a group of spirits get together and they've worked together before and they assemble, they assemble the base, they assemble the outside. Then they have another high spirit come and they kind of cut it off a bit. And he makes some changes because something may not be perfect enough. And then they come, they start doing the inside, and it's all from their minds. This is this is where, you know, it would be great to be a, you know, on on this team. So therefore, and then also when they create these buildings, these people are, are still attached. So they feel an affinity to their to their creation. And when people come in and out, they're still there. They understand, they, you know, they understand who uses it. And if something needs to be changed, they'll be called. So what's the purpose? They were building this temple. What's the purpose of the temple? So spirits need rest and recharging, especially when the spirits who come to earth, you know, coming here in the midst of all this dense matter with, you know, gray clouds around us is not easy. This is what the temple is used for. I'll quote. The temple is being used for the storage of energy into which those will be baptized who come from the different parts of sphere five and also from the spheres below from time to time. They are immersed in its vibrations of color, 
laved in the streams and fountains of water, which are within, are swathed in web and woof of music, the while, their nature responding. They are strengthened in the parts where strength is lacking, or enlightened in those parts where intelligence is dimmed. But mark you, it is not a sanatorium merely, but of, shall I say, higher quality. Its use will be both for body and personality, to fit for the spirit for the journey onward, not alone in bodily strength, but also in intellectual clarity, by which he may the more readily and the more greatly profit by the knowledge it is to him come at, but also himself is attuned to those who love and life or focus on that glorious temple and who await the pilgrims coming to their own higher places. So this is where you rest, you relax, you re-energize, you're given clues to what have vexed you before. There are other stories in the books by G. Bao and I, that I talk about in how how spirits, uh, spirits in the, in the spirit world, is, you know, you're, you when you have a question, if there was this guy was sitting there in a team of people, and they were told by spirits, okay, Jesus is coming. You guys have a very important task. I want you to get into a group of people and think about what you each individually need to improve on or need to know to get your task done. And then Jesus came. And he just like, you know, materialized himself in multiple places at once. And he said each person was given that that boost and that little extra nugget of knowledge so they could get what they wanted done quicker and more efficiently. So. Now, let's get more into the colleges. Now, the interesting is on the fifth level, there are three main cities with a grand meeting place in the middle, and the three cities form an equilateral triangle with a meeting place in the middle. And then what we're told is the reason for this threefold domination is found in this sphere. It stands at that altitude, which having attained, a choice has to be made as the particular way to be followed thereafter. It is a kind of sorting room, as one would say, wherein are the inhabitants in the course of their sojourn there classified into their proper groups and proceed onward in that special branch of service for which they are most properly fitted. Now, what those three are, I don't know. I know one of them is the creative process where you go and you help create planets and new animal life and plant life, etc. But there must be two other main branches. I don't know what they are. If anybody knows, let me know, but it, this is you know another exciting part of heaven. So let's get to an ascension ceremony. When you go from one level, from one sphere to the next, you are actually transformed. You're not just given this piece of paper, right? This diploma. You are actually transformed. You are less matter, more energy. You are brighter, less dense, and there's more attributes at your disposal. Think of yourself as a smartphone, say, and you have the right to put more applications on that smartphone to give you more ability to get information or do things. And this is what, again, which is an exciting part of heaven is that when it shows, there's just a lot, a lot, a lot there. And so, there was a graduation ceremony as described by this uh, by one of the spirits and they went to this great temple right and there was this on this, this big top of a mountain and there was a huge number of people from all over that sphere and jesus came out and he kind of brought this ramp down and then this this flood of light kind of a mist came down and it created and it created a floor of kind of a uh, sea glass and then for some, and then it kind of lapped on people's legs, right? So they're all standing there. And then for some people, this kind of form went up and it, it gave them a different color. And then there was, there was stars rotating around their head. And in that ceremony, those were the people that would, were going to ascend to the next level. They were showing everyone in that area. Okay. This is like this whole population of wherever city, you know, you know, geographical location was at. Here are the people that are going to ascend during this meeting. And, you know, and it changes you physically. So, uh, 
Now, let's just talk a little bit where Sphere 11, because that is very mysterious still. I mean, all of them are somewhat mysterious, but it is where the spirits who talk to Jibaon, where they say is where creation really begins. And this is the only mention that I have seen so far about spheres higher than 10, where the souls focus on bringing, you know, where we they on bringing the souls going through the learning process on earth, right, 10 to below is finally left behind. So this is what he said by the spirit Arnell. Hitherto, the duties performed by those spirits in their advance has been, on the whole, a protective and strengthening quality. Guardian angels, you would call them, perhaps. But those who enter sphere 11 now take on another series of duties. Their service now develops into that which is creative. They begin to learn the great mysteries of the universe of life, not now as to its operative power, as more outwardly manifest, but as to its more inward potential, potential, as it is found nearer to those holy ones who dwell about the Father's home. So this is, you know, who knows what that really means. There, I know there was a, talking about a couple of spirits in one of the books by Ji Bao Owen, who graduated that level, and they were they were taken to husband a a primitive race they're still a, a, a planet a primitive planet and to start guiding their culture and to become a planet of atonement and of course this is you know part of the creative process so at the end i know i've been too long on this talk but you are in a classroom at this very moment and you should make the most of your life make yourself worthy of heaven this is not a new trial. This is, you know, what you're going through is probably a chance of a retest. And as you live through it, rejoice in the knowledge that you won't have to live through this again if you do it the best you can through the trials and tribulations. Pay attention to what is being taught to you. Try to keep a calm exterior. Try to learn and analyze what you've gone through. And in that way, you'll ascend and you can help others. So I want to say thank you for everyone listening to, to me tonight, and uh, God bless all of you. Thank you, Brian. You know, it's interesting when you present this study because um, it talks to us about these comparative studies, which I think are definitely certainly to it. And when we're talking, for example, about the sphere level, uh, it reminds me of the teaching of Andrea Buys in the book Evolution in the Worlds when he reports to the high spirits who are at pure level taking care of the, and I'll say this, baby spirits, you know. Right, yeah, yeah in the cosmos, right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he talks about it. So you see this beautiful, you know, universality of the teachings, as Kardec says, and it makes sense. And uh, here's a teaser for all of us who are studying throughout. You know, whenever we think about the universality of these teachings and Jesus saying that he would send the promised consoler to everybody, we usually think with a Western mentality, you know, like the Western Judeo uh, Christian traditions. But you know, we can find it too in the Eastern philosophies and past Jesus as well. I've been talking to friends about it, and this is just a teaser for us to recognize that this consolation that he said in the truth is coming. I know spiritism is the expression of it, but I don't think it's res is restricted to a single label. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Uh, I know some of the questions that we've had here, Brian, you've answered, you know, but I don't know if you want to, uh, it's basically like Lawrence uh, was asking about the control of thoughts and emotions. And if we can't control the active belief system, he has questions regarding like that. I, I think that you, you want to say something else besides See. Yeah, there's a. There are so many questions. I'm trying to see which one. Okay, let me scroll up. Yeah. I talked about the rivers. Oh, how we can 
control our thoughts. Yeah. <clears throat> and then and that one is, you know, that's a whole, I could go on forever for that. Right. And, and there's a great, and one of my books, um, inner peace through spiritism. And what it is, is there was a great poem by Andre Luis. It had 24 verses. It was in the book, uh, Missives of Hope, Spiritual Wisdom. And I, I could go for that. And I'll, I'll, we'll have another lecture on that one. If I if you invite me back. Yeah. I'll, because, you know, because there's two, two things you're talking about. I like to talk about the physicality of the spirit world. But there's also, okay, I know the physicality and I, I want to go there and I want to and be better. So what do I need to do exactly? Right. And so I could, you know, I don't want to just, you know, come not back. give justice to the subject. Come back. Come back. We're going to talk about a date. So you come back. We want you back. And especially about this topic. It's so important nowadays about uh, controlling thoughts and emotions and how spiritism can really be so wonderful giving us a direction. Right, Brian? Right. So thank you, Brian. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We feel more inspired and recharged. Thank <laughs> you. So now I'm going to invite our friend Luciana to join us as we are going to prepare everybody for the passes. She's going to lead us into this preparation so we feel like we're receiving this, the spiritual magnetism of the spirits, if I may say this way. I don't want to be too technical about the terms, but as we say in spiritism, whatever you are on, on, on earth, of course, but especially when you are in your house, make sure now you can quiet down and work. Yeah, there is a noise here, so don't worry. We're taking care of this. We're asking Luciana to lead us into the path and the time of prayer. So let us all now receive the blessings that the higher realms of heaven have prepared for us tonight. Let us close our eyes, breathing in all the good energies that God has provided to us. Breathing out, letting go all the energies that are no, no, no longer needed in our system. As we breathe in and out, consciousness, consciously that we are bringing hell, inhaling good vibration to treat our souls and body and letting in go everything unnecessary. And as we connect with the good spirits of Kardec Radio, the Spirit Society of Virginia, doctors and nurses, we feel their loving care enveloping us on this healing light of lavender color. healing every soul every, every soul healing 
every cells of our bodies healing everywhere where is needed of much treatment and as we heal ourselves we share with humanity this love and healing vibration starting with the network of friends that we have and then their network and as this light this lavender light enveloping our whole planet healing every one of us we receive these energies that is much much needed at this time we all bathe ourselves in this light of healing feeling lighter feeling the warmth and feeling that we can fluctuate and go above leaving this place making the real connection with God we feel his loving and care for all of us and as we keep feeling his loving and care all our soul is feeling rejuvenated feeling good and now as we return feeling much better we can feel the body re-energized And we feel that we are ready to work and co-create with God. And with this loving vibration that the mentors of the SSVA in Kardec Radio has provided to us tonight, we move on to the next part of our prayer. So, dear Mother, Father God, mentors of the SSVA, We pray together with you. Praying that we all feel this new teaching in our souls. Thank you so much for this time among friends that are here through the internet 
that are connected to us from all over the world. And with your guidance and protection, dear Father, we close the meeting of tonight. And so be it. Thank you, Nana. Thank you, friends. We thank Paloma and especially Brian Foster for leading us into this educational session. May it be truly therapeutic to you as it boosts in us new knowledge for new habits and thus creating a new state of heaven in our minds. So dear friends, if you have any question, don't hesitate to contact us at cardiacradio.com. We'll be happy to answer to your questions or even forward to those who can best assist you. For now, we wish you lots of blessings and until next time.